Please tell us or whatever. And, I, and it, there's just so much that we already rely on that filtering process mm -hmm. before we choose stuff. That's absolutely right. I mean, we, have, we have models from elsewhere in cyberspace. I mean, imagine if the way that a search engine works is every time you have a website, two people get picked to peer review the website, and then what comes on, the, uh, on top on your uh, internet search would be the one that's review, refereed by two people, as opposed to, say, Google, Google page rankings, oh, which is entirely <laughs> implicit based on hundreds of thousands of choices of who links to whom, which is a kind of collective vote as to which website. Have you talked? Any, that's a great idea. You could become a billionaire, I think. If you <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and in a sense, the, I, don't, I think we don't know what the best model is going to be for scientific review. There's got to be some sort of quality control. Whether the current system of two to three referees uh, picked by a human being uh, and having veto power over paper is the best system, I, I tend to doubt. But don't you think that's what's good about science? It doesn't depend on the human peer reviewing. What, what ventures it sees is what works. Yes. People pick up, what, well, that's what's good about science, what works survives. The garbage doesn't anyway, and what work, people pick up on it because it works and allows them to go further. And so it, it's just the scientific process that, that, that moves beyond that, that, that sort of human yeah. frailty. It's a anyway. self-healing self process, which yeah. is why single fraudulent reports don't corrupt the entire enterprise. For a while they can. For a, for a little while they can, but, but the, the enterprise works around them. Are there any good examples of an absolutely excellent paper that was suppressed? in the modern era, and it took a while before it bubbled up? Oh, sure. I, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's um, the ones about, you know, that, well, there's, yeah, there's a whole, I think physics more, I'm referring to. In physics. Well, in biochemistry, in um, biochemistry. my friend yeah, John those are, In other words, the nice thing about physics is you can sit down with a piece of paper and generally calculate. Again, if it's an experimental result, it's harder. But a theoretical, are there any No, the ones I think some more being ignored rather than suppressed. Right. I mean, okay. just people yeah. didn't realize the importance. But right, right. I don't know. But I think, in, I think Richard's right. There are suppressions, and I think, but one of the reasons, maybe because of, I tend to think, maybe because of money, that biochemical things, I mean, there's a lot more money in, in medicine and, and pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. that unfortunately adds a whole different set of pressures that we don't really have yeah, in physics sure. at this point. Um, there's a, there was a, a, a list was going around. This is a slightly cheesy question. You'll forgive me in advance. But there was a, there was a question on the Freakonomics column of the New York Times recently that said, you know, you get these top ten lists of who's the best, who named the top 10 sci uh, people you know. And, and we never get a who are the top 10 scientists list, right? It's OK. So in fact, if you go and take a look at it, you're, it's mostly the people at this table as it happens. But asking you the same sort of thing over the past 350 years, not who was your, not, don't give me a list of Newton and, yeah. and Darwin. Can you, can you think of some unsung heroes that people really should go and, uh, go and figure out what they were doing? and? Well, you know, I think that's the wrong question. All right, okay. You're too, people are too fixated on people. And, and, I mean, it's great. I mean, it's nice to have scientific role models, and I think it's good for kids to have scientific role models. But the people are, I mean, you know, they may have been amazing people. Well, and in its historical context, it's, perp it's wonderful. But, this, but they're irrelevant to the science. Yeah, well, well let yeah. me tell you, the, 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 the practice of science, and science as a method, is one thing. And I agree with you about that. But I find out that, I find that practically, if you tell people Bill Hamilton's life story and what he discovered, but put it in the context of who Bill Hamilton was, it somehow comes alive in a different way. Oh, sure. Kind to get way. people in interested, it's true. But Richard, whole, do you, do you see what I'm getting yeah, at? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I, there's a whole realm of journalism I call People Magazine mm. sort of science reporting, which is that's not what I'm talking about. Everyone, you know, I, and I agree with you. We need to make we need to humanize the endeavor. People have to realize that scientists are human, and that's why. Um, you know, there's a lot of efforts, in fact, and I think both Brian and I are in this and maybe a bunch of the others here trying to get scientific themes in Hollywood. And, and, and so scientists, on, uh, you know, it's more integrated into the culture. So people realize that scientists are people and the scientific endeavor is culturally interesting, etc. I agree with you completely there to humanize it. But, but, and, and so that's important. And that's difficult in itself. You know, you have a series like Lie to Me on Fox TV now, which is based on the Paul Ekman's work, of course. The, facial expressions and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it's hard to convey some of the science yeah. in, in those sorts of things. But I, st I, still, I still liked my question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, according to one poll, the uh, people were asked to name the uh, name famous scientist, and the one who came out on top was Bill Gates, and the second one was Al Gore. So we have, we have some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, last question then. Uh, over that over that period of the operation of this enterprise, the, the, the merchants of light, um, going forward, what, what's the most exciting thing in each of your fields that you, that you um, are looking forward to? 
Well, I mean, well, uh, I'll just... That's another People magazine question. Yes, well, anyway, I mean, for the simple answer, answer when someone asks me what's the next great thing, I always I say if I knew, I'd be doing it. Thing. But, but uh, I mean, I think there are... And Einstein fields, said if it wasn't field, called research, well, I don't want yeah. to usurp. I bet Brian and I agree on almost... And it, it's, that's what's great. And you can add to, to this. Uh, but but there, in cosmology, it's, what, what, it's this nature of this weird energy that dominates a, empty space. In particle physics, I think it's the, it's the domain that Brian has written about a lot, which is the tr way to try and unify the forces of nature and understand quantum mechanics and gravity and and those are the the, the frontiers um, but you know where the next great discovery will be you know maybe somewhere else I don't know if they yeah the only thing I would add to that is in my wildest dreams what I'd hope to happen before I leave this 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 earth or universe is maybe we'll understand what are the basic constituents of space and time. I mean, there's a lot of evidence that space and time are derivative, emergent ideas, but we don't really know what the fundamental constituents of them would be. And we've got hints of it, and maybe that's something we'll make progress on. I think for, for my field, the sciences of mind, the most exciting development is the uh, melting of boundaries between uh, psychology and other sciences, and other fields of endeavor, in fact the birth of neuroeconomics, of behavioral economics, of, uh, of uh, evolutionary psychology, of the psychology of aesthetics, of moral psychology applied to jurisprudence and moral philosophy, the uh, elimination of these 19th century disciplinary boundaries that, uh, that I think stood in the way of uh, a coherent understanding. But, uh, I know I'm going to jump in. I have, that's another advertisement. That was the thing we were trying to achieve at this meeting, and that, that's the thing we're going to continue to try and achieve. But I should also say out of, as well that Brian and I are, are biased. We we're, were talking about particle physics. It's probably a related aspect of that, which is that is probably also extremely exciting, which is a dis the disappearance of the boundaries between physics and biology, which I think will be another huge threshold area. Well, I, I think I, I would have to say understanding consciousness, which is more huh? Steve's field than, than, than mine. So, so I, I won't say that because it's not my field. Um, I think I would say perhaps a complete computer simulation of um, an origin of artificial life and subsequent evolution in an artificial world with its own physics and its own um, ecology, its own ecosystem, a, 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 a second life that actually evolves rather than being designed by, by humans. Well, the most exciting thing in my field is, uh, is science, because I'm not a scientist. I'm a <laughs> philosopher and a, a spectator and an amateur of, of science. And uh, it is thrilling, I'm, I mean, beyond description, really, to see, to see what's happening. I mean, ac across all these fields, cosmology and, and fundamental particle physics in, in biology and uh, biomedical sciences, you know, the progress that's being made now is, is really extraordinary. And um, I'm, because I have an interest in, in philosophy and philosophy of mind as well, you know, what's happening in neuroscience and its effect on uh, understanding psychology and, and on consciousness. But um, what, what, what all this does, in a way, is to show that Lawrence has pointed out to be right, that the sciences are bleeding into one another, the boundaries are coming down, that, that what's in, in effect happening is that we're having a, a sort of a new um, second wind of the Enlightenment. I, t I talked earlier about the way that uh, uh, ideas and methods in the natural sciences have been applied more broadly, social sciences and humanities in the Enlightenment to alter our conceptions of society and, and uh, human nature and, and uh, human flourishing. And with this uh, breach in the walls of the different disciplines because there's been too much over specialism we all know that since the 19th century since the German attitude to uh, how you conduct research uh, r really became the dominant paradigm and now that all these these um, walls are being breached and we are seeing tremendous amount of cross fertilization and as a result huge new insights so you know to be a spectator of this process is to be enthralled by it well thank you gentlemen Richard uh, AC Grayling Lawrence Steve Pinker, Brian Green. Um, I'll see you back here in 2360. I hope for the so. Seven, <laughs> for the 700th anniversary of the Society. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot.